Hello, everyone. Um, welcome back to the International Symposium on Alternatives Assessment. Um, hope you enjoyed a, a short break. Um, we're entering kind of our, our last session for the day. Um, and uh, let's just get into it. Um, I'm not even up. Oh. There we go. So um, today is our sixth session um, and the topic is on uh, future needs of alternatives assessment um, and the A4, the, the Association for the Advancement of Alternatives Assessment. And um, I, I think as what, what, what we've heard across um, all of the sessions um, today is that the field of alternatives assessment and our A4 community um, is really rapidly growing. Um, so this session is gonna go a bit deeper into some of the needs and opportunities for the alternatives assessment community or practice to really stay relevant um, and adapt to um, kind of chemical management, uh, chemicals management goals as, as they're evolving, which we, we heard a, a, a kind of what how, how this trajectory is going, especially in the EU um, and, and yesterday's talks. Um, so for um, today, like, it's interesting, I'm trying to advance the slide. Um, once again, we just wanna thank our sponsors. Um, without their support, um, this symposium um, would not really be able to, um, uh, to be achieved in, in, in the way that we're doing it. So thank you to all of our generous sponsors. Um, again, this you all have seen this slide a number of times, but I'm just, uh, uh, session etiquette, if you will, for using Zooms. We just ask that all of your lines and your video, your lines are muted and that your videos are off. Um, it's really nice for us to see who's present. Um, so if you're kind of calling in with a phone number, um, try to, you know, uh, go ahead and try to change your name by clicking on the dot, dot, dot that you'll see next to your image or next to your name um, and add your organization. It's nice to see where um, the diversity of, of people um, participating in this um, symposium, you know, from government, from industry, from um, NGOs, uh, from consulting firms, really great to see who's, who's kind of with us as part of this community. Um, use the speaker view. It is really the best way to see kind of both the speaker and the slides. Um, for this particular session, um, we've kind of found it easiest to, um, uh, to write your questions to speakers in the, uh, in the chat. Um, each of our speakers will have 15 minutes to deliver their presentation, and we have an additional five minutes immediately following their presentation for Q&A. So um, if your question is complicated, um, go ahead and raise your hand. Um, we'll look at you in the participant list and, and call you that way, but otherwise, um, probably the easiest thing to do for this session is to use the chat. Um, we are recording this. Um, it's going to be available to A4 members and also everyone who's registered for the symposium, and we'll make it available to the public um, in a couple months. Um, and with that, um, I will introduce our first speaker. So again, I'm Molly Jacobs. Um, I'm a senior research associate at the University of Massachusetts Lowell and I'm quite active in our A4 uh, program committee and um, just thrilled to have um, the participation from all of you today and um, our great lineup of speakers um, for today's session. And so um, I'll introduce each of them as they, as they come up, but our first speaker um, is Alexandra uh, Martins, um, who's a research associate at um, Johns Hopkins University. Um, and I'll just hand, um, go ahead and turn your video on, Alexandra, and your mic, and we'll give you controls of your, sli of your slides. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Okay. Okay, hi. Uh, my name is Alexandra Martins. I work at the Johns Hopkins Center for the Alternatives to Animal Testing, and I'm here to talk about regrettable substitutions, how we can make toxicology data count a little bit more uh, to provide better guidance. So I think everybody here at this point is kind of fami uh, familiar with the Gr Regrettable Substitutions Hall of Fame. Uh, certainly DDT looms kind of large in there as well as flame retardants, which have been discussed a great deal, uh, and BPA, which I'll focus on a little bit more in this lecture. Um, so I, I won't kind of revisit the topic of regrettable substitutions um, because I think everybody is familiar with it, but I think it's worthwhile to kind of stop and think about how the discourse about regrettable substitutions um, is affecting how people interpret the chemical industry. 
So I'm always dismayed when I tell people that I work in the space of green chemistry, uh, when people are really skeptical about the very possibility of green chemistry. They're like, well, how, you know, how are you going to design safer chemicals every time you replace one chemical with another? You know, there's just some unknown hazard. And, you know, I think that even within the uh, toxicology community, there is that perception. So this was, you know, this was an opinion piece written by a toxicologist who said, you know, we have to stop playing whack-a-mole with hazardous chemicals. So this perception that we're just, you know, swapping one bad chemical out for another uh, really undermines the very idea of green chemistry and the idea that science can provide uh, a safe environment. So we decided to look into this topic about how we have regrettable substitutions and the way that toxicology kind of played a role uh, in regrettable substitutions and how we can improve our data to prevent this going forward. Um, so we didn't do a systematic review. We just kind of did a very kind of basic scoping review. Um, but one of the really interesting things we discovered was that regrettable substitutions are very rarely mentioned in the literature that's aimed at toxicologists. So most toxicologists that focus on, you know, human toxicity issues really look in PubMed, but there are only four mentions uh, in a PubMed search of regrettable substitutions. There were 301 in Google Scholar, and this likely reflects the fact that, uh, that a lot of the discussion about regrettable substitutions takes place in journals that are focused on environmental law, um, or the risk analysis community, and a lot of that is really invisible to toxicologists. It's not something that they focus on a lot. Um, most of the chemicals were repeatedly referred to in the literature. So from the um, articles that we located in Google Scholar, BPA was mentioned in over half of them. Uh, phthalates 118, flame retardants were in 177. So one thing to think about is that when we're talking about regrettable substitutions, we're really kind of talking about a handful of chemicals, but not really looking at the broader substitution space. And there were only two studies that used a quantitative approach. Uh, and this was the only study that actually found that, um, that alterations over time actually had improved the hazard profile. Um, and there was another study that looked at trade-offs and in insecticides. So fundamentally, a lot of the discourse about regrettable substitutions is really not focusing on whether we're actually improving things, but just sort of talking about a handful of case studies. Um, when we looked at the causes of regrettable substitutions, I think most of these will be familiar here. Uh, failure to consider functional use, endpoint trade-off, life cycle considerations, failure to consider exposure, etc. I won't spend a lot of time on that, um, but I think it's worthwhile thinking about how toxicology data plays into this. So one of the main reasons for failure um, to consider functional use or why that plays a role is because when you focus exclusively on the toxicity profile of a, of a chemical concern, that really um, kind of leads you to incremental change and a drop in approach, right? The easiest friction-free way to eliminate a chemical of concern is to just substitute a closely related chemical. But this doesn't look at other better opportunities to really cause drastic change. And this is something toxicologists don't really think about when they're thinking about talking about hazard. They don't really think about, well, maybe we should think about what this chemical is doing and why. Uh, a lot of it was a failure to consider exposure. So most screening level assessments and regulations focus on hazard alone. But, uh, and you know, in many instances, the ultimate goal is to engineer hazard away. But a substitution uh, which increases, you know, hazard may ultimately be regrettable. And one example of this was copper, which was blacklisted uh, for use as an exterior building material and was replaced with asphalt or PVC. But this was largely based on data for copper salts and fumes, which is not really a relevant exposure for roof material. And of course, endpoint trade-off, uh, swapping human toxicity for ecotoxicity, for example. Um, another common cause was failure to consider life cycle concerns. So hazard endpoints are typically one of the key um, inputs for life cycle analysis. But often toxicology just doesn't provide the sort of granularity you need. So it'll use a binary endpoint for mutagenicity or skin sensitization, yes or no. But really, you want potency. And there's not really any good way to, you know, weigh and uh, to weigh different endpoints. So is a chemical with high potency for skin sensitization, skin sensitization, preferable to chemically, you know, chemical with low but not zero potential for reproductive and developmental effects. But fundamentally, uh, the one biggest thing was just a fundamental lack of hazard data. And in some instances, this was understandable, right? A lot of the effects were simply unknowable uh, when the chemical was first manufactured. So very few people could have foreseen endocrine disrupting chemicals when phthalates were first manufactured. But the process of chemical substitution itself may inadvertently encourage chemicals with no data compared to existing chemicals. So for example, the push to substitute BPA came from consumers, 
Uh, and the easiest way to make a product BPA free was just to swap a similar chemical BPS, which at the time had no data, but or very little data, I should say. And remarkably, and I think this is worth pausing and thinking about, is that the only study in our sample that focused on consumer perception found that consumers actually preferred chemicals with no established hazard uh, to chemicals with known hazards. In other words, they preferred chemicals that just didn't have any data compar you know, uh, compared to chemicals with sort of known hazards. So why do we get into this situation? Why do we not have enough data? Well, fundamentally, an in vivo characterization takes uh, way too long to be useful as a regulatory tool and definitely too long to be useful for alternative assessments. It takes, you know, uh, for thousands of chemicals, it would take, you know, five to 25 million each. The number of animals alone would be unsustainable and we don't even have enough toxicologists to interpret the data. But more fundamentally, the regulatory approaches to toxicology have been really kind of focused on black box animal assays. Um, and these protect against hazards, but only very, very slowly. So asbestos, for example, had established hazards very early on, but it took a very long time to translate that into useful regulation. And of course, BPA, uh, there's still no consensus on what is a safe level. But fundamentally, this also provides no information to guide molecular design. Um, it just tells you an endpoint, but it doesn't tell you how you got to that endpoint. And as an employee of CAT, I'm legally required to tell you uh, that people are not 70 kilogram rats. So to remind you that all of this is based on something that may or may not be relevant to human health. Um, but you can also be in situations, as I mentioned, with BPA, where we have a lot of data, but the data isn't actually that helpful. So BPA has been subjected to multiple guideline studies in different species and strains. Uh, there's over 10,000 abstracts uh, in PubMed for BPA. Um, and HSDB has over 79 laboratory animal studies. Uh, and if you look at the comparative toxicogenomics database, um, somebody somewhere has studied BPA and found that it you know, affects almost 2,000 genes, and that's just when restricted to humans. So we're clearly not in a data poor situation in this case. But this data, nonetheless, really hasn't led to a lot of consensus. So what went wrong? Why are we in this position with BPA? Fundamentally, there were a couple of causes. One was a failure to understand mechanism. There was a failure to test enough doses to really characterize a non-monotonic dose response curve or a low dose response. Uh, there was a lack of concordance between academic and regulatory testing and sort of a perception of partisanship and bias in the literature. Um, so just the failure to understand mechanism, if you're an R&D chemist and somebody says, well, BPA binds to the estrogen receptor, your next thought is, oh, that's simple. I'll just add the sulfonyl group and it will no longer bind, right? So the problem is solved. But the reality is BPA binds both estrogen receptor alpha and estrogen receptor gamma. And it actually binds estrogen receptor gamma with a higher affinity than BPA. So this is unlikely to be, to be detected by animal testing. And this is why we now have you know, one to 10 million tons of BPS produced per year. Um, another problem with BPA was that, uh, oops, hang on. Another problem with BPA uh, is that a lot of the effects that we're concerned about are really at low dose, but regulatory toxic toxicity testing is often done at very high doses that are often uh, irrelevant to human exposures. Um, but another problem is, is that people often say, well, BPA has low dose effects, but when low dose is used in the literature, it's often not very precisely defined. So a recent review found that low dose effects covered uh, doses at eight to 10, you know, eight to 12 orders of magnitude difference. But when it's published in news articles, often it you know, just says low dose. So we have to think about how we communicate that to be a little bit more precise. Another concern with BPA that has been a bit more difficult is the non-monotonic dose response curve. And this is mathematically defined just as a shift in the um, direction of the curve. But this is a problem for regulatory toxicity testing because it often doesn't test enough doses to establish this. Um, and Two systematic reviews were carried out recently for NMDRs, and they found that the overwhelming number of articles had very weak evidence for them. There was only one outlying dose, insufficient number of doses, et cetera. Interestingly, 14% of the data sets concerned BPA, but this is not one of the data sets that actually demonstrated an NMDR. Um, another problem is the difference between academic and regulatory data. So uh, a lot of academic studies are more hypothesis generating rather than uh, focusing on the precision that you need for regulatory approaches. But a recent FDA evaluation found that of the um, research that was done, only 
very few of the studies were actually sufficiently rigorous to inform hazard or uh, risk assessment. So 121 of 142 studies were rejected. And it's worth pausing and thinking about this. This means that the overwhelming majority of academic studies, often involving min minimal animals, were not useful to sort of make any sort of informed regulatory decision about BPA. Um, and there's a lot of argument over the literature that just sort of focuses on, uh, on uh, different perceptions. So in order to kind of bring different groups together, there was the BPA clarity study that was designed by both academic and government regulators. This involved over 3,500 animals, but it still hasn't settled the debate about safety or even really established a mechanism. And I think, you know, if this hasn't settled it, maybe it's time to think that we're not, you know, we're gathering the wrong kind of data, that there has to be a better way. Um, and there is. You know, it's very cheap and quick to do in vitro mechanistic studies, right? Um, and we, you know, were able at CAT to take advantage of an existing uh, transcriptomic study. And this is cheap to do. It was done on MCF7 cells, so we actually got human data. Uh, and, you know, you could kind of establish with this that at low doses, BPA did not trigger estrogen receptor related dreams. Uh, it did trigger a lot of very poorly characterized transcription factors at low doses, um, but this was difficult to see at high doses because of the activation of the estrogen receptor. And a lot of these transcription factors were primate specific or they acted very differently in different species, so they would have been completely invisible in animal models. So the way forward, I think it's going to look a lot more like this and a lot less like the uh, testing paradigms of the past. But fundamentally, you have to kind of, you know, realize that data isn't enough, right? All of this data from a molecular system uh, doesn't really tell you anything about what you need to know to design a safer chemical. We have to sort of put all that data together and make it information with bioinformatics. We have to be able to use quantitative approaches uh, so that we can model it. And we have to be able to establish very clear um, explanations that you know, involve how we can uh, mathematically define what is the critical point that we need to con be concerned about safety. So we have a long way to go with this. Uh, we're still on step one, trying to put our data together and to make it information with bioinformatics. Um, and in conclusion, I just kind of like to remind toxicologists of something I think is worth thinking about. Um, every chemist, when they design a molecule or is unconsciously or unconsciously making a decision about toxicity, uh, Amy Cannon from uh, Beyond Benign pointed this out. I think the corollary for toxicologists is that every toxicologist, when they publish about hazard, is unconsciously or consciously make a decision that could impact supply chains. So if you say, oh, chemical X at low doses, you know, is going to cause, you know, endpoint Y, even if your data, you know, your low dose data isn't that low dose, you are potentially making a decision that could impact supply chains. So I think, you know, the way to think about how we can improve this, definitely more data is always better. Uh, no toxicologist is gonna tell you we need less, you know, less data, but we really need to get better data. We have to stop doing studies. You know, another 12 rat study on BPA is not gonna move the needle on improving the safety hazard. We have to rethink how we're gathering the data and be more rigorous. We have to be really kind of humble about what we don't know. Um, you know, I think with the BPA, there are a lot of transcription factors and biological mechanisms we just haven't discovered yet. And I use the examples of x-rays as kind of a useful uh, thing to think about how we predict hazard. So for years, x-ray technicians were developing, you know, these terrible problems with their hands, cancers, lesions, et cetera, and nobody could figure out why. They assumed it must be the developing chemical or something like that. Of course, we know it was radiation, right? That's obvious to us. But at the time it was completely missed because nobody could imagine something, you know, as invisible and, you know, difficult to, you know, difficult to measure as radiation could actually cause a health effect like that, right? It was completely outside their paradigm of hazard assessment. And we also really have to be realistic about hazard and risk and how we communicate this to the general public and be a little bit more careful in how we talk about this. So that is uh, my talk. Questions or comments um, are open. You can email, put my email address. I would encourage everyone to uh, follow Kat on Twitter and you can sign up for our newsletter. And I'd like to thank Emily Golden, Thomas Hartung and the entire Kat team. Any, uh, any questions? Fantastic. Thank you so, thank you so much, Alexandra. Um, we do have um, one, question, uh, one question coming in and um, please, if you have questions for Alexandra, um, great for you to um, post them in the chat. Um, 
uh, what our first question is from Huckleberry Palmer, um, who says, who asks, it would be interesting to estimate how much funding it would require to test every major chemical used in uh, industry using cell lines. I think that's more of a comment than a question. Um, but, you know, I think this issue of, of, of resources comes up and I know that in vitro testing is actually going to go a long way, but I don't know, any, any reaction to uh, Huckleberry's comment there? Um, yeah, I would say it's a lot cheaper to do that than to test it in rats. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I think that's a great idea because that's basically the full employment act for, you know, computational toxicologists. So excellent idea. Um, but I think more broadly speaking, um, you know, it's probably useful to kind of prioritize things by exposure, right? And that's why I think, you know, toxicologists spend so much time in hazard that we don't think about exposure, but, it, you know, exposure is a key point. <laughs> so, you know, if we start prioritizing what we look, at, look like at exposure, that's probably um, the easiest way to focus. And in terms of testing them on every cell line, you know, we would, we would probably get some useful data that way, but I would actually suggest uh, something a little bit more radical. Um, you know, you can't really test chemicals on humans, right? That's not ethical, but the reality is we are doing those tests. Once a chemical is out there, it is being tested on humans. We're just not capturing the data. Mm -hmm. So I think we really need to switch to an exposomics approach where we track what people are being exposed to with much more precision than we have in the past. And we start looking for things that just wouldn't pop up and occur to us. Um, there's post-market surveillance on chemicals for a reason, right? Uh, you know, there's a lot of our post-market surveillance on medicines. We don't do that for chemicals. And I think we need to start considering, you know, what that would look like. Yeah. Um, thank you. All right, so we have an interesting question from um, Pam Spencer. Um, and she asks, drawing on the comment from Dr. Warner at the opening of um, our symposium, um, he, he mentioned that you will get different answers from different people on what data and even what tests are needed to establish safety. Um, so do you have any kind of suggestions for overcoming this issue? Um, no, I, th I think that's a really tough issue. Um, and I, I think, you know, the case of, of BPA is an example of, of people looking at the exact same data and drawing very different conclusions. And I don't think there's an easy way to resolve that. Mm -hmm. But I do think if we keep doing the same thing, we're going to keep arguing over the same data. Like, I think everybody needs to pause, step back and, uh, I, I, I can't remember who said, said this, but somebody said, you know, if two people are arguing over something for more than five minutes, either somebody needs to get more data or somebody is just being a jerk. So I think that we need to just get more data. We need to figure out what data would settle this argument um, and how we, you know, then how do we kind of, how do we go forward from that? Right. I know, for example, um, in the National Academy's a, a port, report on kind of guiding the selection of safer alternatives, um, there's a, you know, there's a section on in vitro data and new approach methods and, and really, you know, stated in there, the need um, to develop both principles and tools that support kind of both the benchmarking as well as the integration across multiple streams of data. Um, and you kind of had that point in your slide that data is one thing, we need bioinformatics, but any insights again on like, um, on your thoughts of, of about these integration of data streams. So again, I think it goes back to Pam's question. It's um, how, do, how do we as a community um, decide you know, what data, what's good enough and what's the best way to integrate it to come to a solution and make decisions about, about safety or about um, uh, whether it's about a given you know, alternative or a, a, you know, a, a product or what have you? Um, that's a good question. I, I would say, um... I think we can point to one real success, which is with skin sensitization and the adverse outcome pathway. Um, and I think that uh, we can build upon that. Um, you know, once we have kind of determined all the molecular mechanisms, it's, it's a lot easier to predict. It's a lot easier to design in vitro tests. So with skin sensitization, I think we've, we've done pretty well with that. You know, we have a lot of in vitro tests and we have models that are at least as accurate as the gold standard animal tests. Mm -hmm. So I think the question is what would it take to replicate that success in other endpoints? And I think the answer is it's gonna be really hard, but it's not impossible. So if you think of, you know, something like um, endocrine disruption, part of the problem is, is that's very poorly defined, right? 
But if we defined it as, okay, what chemicals, you know, are going to impact, you know, say uh, metabolism enough that we can say that they're obesogens, that is actually a tractable problem if we can quantify the AOP. And we can do that. I mean, it's not going to be easy, but it is possible with enough time, enough data, and enough bioinformatics. Yeah, very good. All right, one, one last question um, um, from Pat Harmon, uh, who says, Alexandra, do you think this regulatory or this approach will be accepted for regulatory approvals, and how long will this take? And there's a comment from um, uh, Kathy Rudolph, who mentions, for example, that not all chemicals currently are suitable to doing in vitro assays. Yeah, uh, I, I would agree with that. Um, but, you know, uh, for example, you know, good, good luck doing an in vitro test on a polymer, right? That's not because not only is, you know, you may have solubility issues, but the problems with polymers are never uh, are rarely the actual polymer itself, but the things that elude off the polymer over time, really it's life cycle considerations, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the degradation products, uh, for example, and you can't capture that in a vitro assay. So I think that gets back to the fact that we really kind of need real time monitoring of what people are exposed to. So for example, uh, there's a lot of efforts, you know, um, at Hopkins, for example, to start looking in the wastewater and figure out what's actually there or to look in, you know, into what actually eludes off plastic bottles and what people are being exposed to when they're drinking from that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably a better way to start capturing that. And I think once we capture that, you know, at some point we will find we will find something that would have been not obvious with animal data or other approaches and you know, EPA will have to make a regulation on that. And I think that will start moving the needle once it becomes apparent that this is offering better safety um, for human outcomes. I think you'll start to see more regulatory acceptance of that approach. Yeah. Well, terrific. Alexandra, thank you so much for um, your presentation. It was fantastic and elicited great questions from our audience. So thank you, um, participants. Um, let's move on to our next speaker. Um, um, so if you would, Vina, go ahead and turn on your video and, and your mic. And um, Vina Singla is a senior scientist um, with the National Resources Defense Council. and um, you know, we're really looking forward to your talk. And what I'm going to do now, which I forgot to do earlier, is um, everybody's uh, full bios um, are in. Uh, I just posted a link to them. So if you want to learn more about each of our, our speakers, go ahead and, and use that link and, um, and learn more. And with Vina, uh, it's uh, the screen is yours. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Molly, and thank you to A4 and the organizers for including this important session. I know we're um, at the very end of the sessions and the, the conference here, so I really appreciate um, everyone who's joined now to really think about the continued evolution and development of um, AA and, and what we need to do now, because as Mahatma Gandhi said, the future depends on what we do in the present. And um, we're all here because we want a different future. So the work that I'm gonna talk about today is funded by the JPB Foundation through Energy Efficiency for All. Um, and that's a national initiative that NRDC is part of. And we've been collaborating closely with Healthy Building Network on this project. Mm -hmm. So um, a little bit about the Natural Resources Defense Council. We're an international environmental nonprofit that employs scientists, lawyers, and policy experts to advocate for evidence-based policies to protect human health and the environment. And we have offices across the US and in Beijing, China. What I'm gonna talk about today is first, I'll give a little background and context on the work to date, um, looking at equity and life cycle analysis um, within alternatives assessment. And then um, I'll go over the um, kind of major approach and framework that we used for these case studies um, and uh, highlight some of our major findings, and I'll end with some recommendations for um, alternatives assessment practice. Mm 
So um, some previous work on integrating equity in AA decisions. This was a report that I co-authored with Californians for a Healthy and Green Economy in 2017. And we interviewed leaders who are working at the intersection of environmental justice and chemical policy and um, had a couple major findings um, from, from this initial research. One is, um, and I probably don't need to tell this audience this, but I'll, um, I'll just say it. One is that ultimately alternatives assessment decisions are based on data and values. So there's the sort of scientific um, data piece of the assessment, but then how you um, ultimately decide, um, you know, which trade-offs are acceptable or whether you value cost and performance over other um, criteria that you evaluated really comes down to the, the values of the organization or, or entity performing the AA. And another major finding was that equity is not explicitly encompassed in major AA frameworks, even though other values-based criteria like public health are included. Um, and some key recommendations to um, kind of guide decisions and start to integrate equity was to ensure that life cycle considerations are included um, in the scope of the AA, and then to really factor in um, disproportionate impacts to socially vulnerable populations um, when making alternatives decisions. So um, the, thinking about some of the current work on life cycle analysis in AA, I think there's a real clear recognition of the need and the importance of integrating life cycle considerations um, as outlined like in this paper from IC2 and as we just heard in the previous presentation that failure to consider life cycle as one of the factors contributing to regrettable substitutions. And there's um, been a lot of work on methods development and applied to integrate life cycle analysis into AA, such as this excellent work from um, Peter Fantke and colleagues. One important element um, that has not yet been considered though is localized impacts, especially for marginalized populations. So the current methods, we're typically looking at aggregated impacts over generalized populations like workers or product users or the public um, and not specific populations that might be impacted by a particular chemical. So we undertook these case studies to explore including life cycle elements that considered these localized impacts, especially as relevant to equity and disproportionate impacts. So first we focused um, our case studies on two building insulation materials, um, spray foam, spray foam insulation and fiberglass ins insulation. And then um, further focused in on one key ingredient in each of those insulation materials. So for a spray foam, that key ingredient is an isocyanate, which makes up about 50% of the product. And for fiberglass, the key ingredient is glass fibers, which make up about 85% um, of the product when we're thinking about um, residential fiberglass um, products that are bat or blown in insulation. We um, thought about potential impacts at some of the key life cycle stages um, shown here in the diagram. So that includes um, chemical manufacturer, product manufacturer, and disposal. And we kind of identified and evaluated impacts through um, two intersecting frameworks of principles. Um, first, the principles of green chemistry, and second, the principles of environmental justice. Uh, now, I think that this audience would be really familiar with the principles of green chemistry, um, but maybe um, not as much with the principles of environmental justice. So I'll tell you a little bit more about those. <laughs> 
So the 17 principles of environmental justice were developed um, collaboratively from the 1991 People of uh, Color Environmental Leadership Summit. And um, we're coincidentally celebrating the 30 year anniversary of that summit um, right, right now. Um, and since that time, um, the principles have been used to guide movements both in the US and internationally. And um, these principles cover important areas that are not covered by the principles of, of green chemistry, um, but there's also some really clear areas of um, intersection and reinforcement. So, for example, um, from the green chemistry side, there's the principle about designing with little to no toxicity. And that um, dovetails really well with the environmental justice principle about ceasing production of toxics and hazardous waste. So for our approach, um, we identified these four major concepts that are covered by the two sets of principles, uh, material health, circularity, waste, and environmental justice. And then we look to various data sources to evaluate the associated impacts. So for um, hazard information on chemicals, we look to um, FAROS, the Healthy Building Network database that aggregates information from 47 authoritative lists. Um, we use publicly available information to locate facilities in the US producing isocyanates and glass fibers. Um, we also use data from EPA toxics release inventory to analyze release data for each facility. And we consider data from um, EPA's EJ screen for um, understanding the demographics of communities within, the, within three miles of each facility. And uh, we look to EPA's enforcement and compliance history online or ECHO um, for information related to facility violations of regulations. And then finally, we look to the Occupational Safety and Health Administration and other publicly available sources for data on accidents at facilities. So what did we find out? Well, um, let's start with the hazards of chemicals um, associated with the key ingredient production. So um, here in this um, diagram is the process to make the isocyanate used in spray foam, a methylene diphenyl diisocyanate or MDI. And MDI is um, circled in the diagram there in blue. So there's, there's a lot going on here and um, you don't need to read all the individual chemicals, but um, the point I wanted to note is that um, all of the chemicals in the boxes here are going in to make um, MD MDI as inputs or as byproducts. So those are the chemicals that we focused on for a um, number of other steps in our analysis. And um, here's the inputs to make glass fibers and glass fibers circled there in blue. And um, again, for the um, subsequent steps, we focused in on those boxed chemicals. Okay, so what did we find out about the key ingredients and the inputs on the hazard front? Well, um, we found that greater than 90% of the inputs to make MDI are hazardous to human health. Um, about half are highly reactive or flammable and greater than 90% are volatile. And MDI itself is also hazardous. It's a well-known respiratory sensitizer. Now the inputs to make glass fibers performed relatively better um, with about 35% having known health hazards, less than 10% being highly reactive or flammable and none being volatile. And glass fibers themselves in the form used to make residential insulation are not hazardous. Um, next, we looked at where the facilities making the key ingredients are located in the US. So um, for MDI, there's four facilities um, producing and they're all located along the Gulf Coast in Texas and Louisiana. For glass fibers and fiberglass, there's 22 facilities producing um, located across the US. 
So next, um, we then focused in on these facilities, the four for MDI and these 22 for fiberglass, um, and looked at toxics release inventory reporting for each facility. And um, we found that um, collectively, and um, just as a reminder, we're here when we're looking at these releases, we're um, focused again on those chemicals that are specifically related to MDI and glass fibers, those chemicals that were boxed in the previous diagrams. So for the MDI facilities, we found um, that they collectively released about 254 metric tons of hazardous chemicals to air and water, and glass fiber facilities released less than 1% of that collectively. The MDI facilities generated over 20,000 metric tons of hazardous waste, while glass fiber facilities generated about 2.5% of that. And um, for both types of facilities, some of this hazardous waste was disposed on site, while some was sent off site for disposal. And the, this is, again, only hazardous waste related to the chemicals involved in MDI and glass fiber production. We also looked at um, end of life and circularity issues. So spray foam is um, not recoverable or recyclable at the end of life because it is foamed in place in a building. Uh, while fiberglass in theory could be recyclable, but it is not recycled in practice. Both materials are generally landfilled at the end of life. The inputs to make MDI almost all come from fossil fuels, um, which is consistent with the location of these facilities on um, the Gulf Coast, co-local with um, fossil fuel and petrochemical in infrastructure. And for um, glass fibers, the inputs consist of 25 to 80% recycled glass and minerals. Finally, we looked at environmental justice considerations. Um, in looking at whether facilities follow environmental regulations, we found that half the MDI facilities had significant violations for every quarter of the last three years, um, compared to 9% of glass fiber facilities. Accidents at MDI facilities had resulted in worker injuries and shelter in place orders for nearby communities, and we didn't find any accidents reported at the glass fiber facilities. Both types of facilities are cited in communities that are disproportionately people of color, low income, or both. So for example, um, collectively, both types of facilities have a much higher percentage people of color within three miles of the facilities. Um, that's 59% for MDI and 46% for glass fibers compared to the 39% average for the US. And then um, finally thinking about um, these cumulative impacts, right? The, the aggregated impacts of many different sources um, of pollution, all of the MDI facilities are cited in places with a heavy burden of other polluting facilities, um, 18 to 29 additional facilities in those cities reporting to the toxics release inventory, and those facilities collectively reporting an additional 1,800 to 6,800 tons of hazardous um, releases in those communities. Looking at the fiberglass facilities, it was much more variable with um, some being cited in locations with other hazardous release facilities and others not. And those additional facilities collectively reported from zero to 544 tons of additional releases in those communities. So overall, um, this approach allows assessment of localized um, impacts from a chemical's life cycle. And um, thinking about the case studies, we found that both materials generate toxic emissions and hazardous waste that disproportionately impact marginalized communities, but fiberglass performed comparatively better um, in all of the four areas that we evaluated. Some limitations in the available data could have resulted in um, 
over or underestimates of hazardous releases. So for example, on the underestimate side, only 770 chemicals are required to be reported to the toxics release inventory. So there could be other hazardous chemicals released that are not reported and that we wouldn't have captured. And on the other hand, um, while we did limit our analysis to chemicals related to MDI production, for example, because a lot of data on these MDI facilities is confidential, um, such as what other chemicals they're producing or the total um, capacity for MDI and these other chemicals, it's possible that some of the chemicals and releases we included are also used in other processes, and thus the releases are not solely reflective of MDI production. So we're hoping to publish um, these case studies and our recommendations early next year. So finally, what, um, how can we start to inform alternatives assessment practice with this kind of thinking? Our initial recommendations are to- mm -hmm. And Vina, I'll need you to go quickly through this. Okay, um, our initial recommendations are to include considerations of life cycle environmental justice impacts in um, scoping the alternatives assessment and to use publicly available information to evaluate um, localized life cycle impacts as well as considering the pr principles of environmental justice and the values that guide your alternatives assessment decisions. And um, finally, understanding impacts on marginalized communities can allow you to make more equitable alternatives decisions by reducing and avoiding um, these impacts when you choose the alternatives. Um, so thank you so much. Just want to um, recognize Rebecca Stam at Healthy Building Network, who did um, most of the work that I presented, and our funder, the JPB Foundation. Thank you. Thank you, Vina. Um, I am having, let's see, a hard time actually spotlighting myself here. Thank you. Um, we have time for just one question. Unfortunately, we only have one in the chat. Um, and it comes from Pat Harmon, uh, who asks, how do you balance resiliency and performance with the other criteria that you um, had noted? Um, for example, after the flooding from Harvey, homes with fiberglass had to throw everything away um, to the landfill or to, uh, for incineration. And those uh, with the polyurethane foam did not. Um, uh, also my neighbors with polyurethane foam have, have lower electric bills. Um, any, any, any kind, those are the, kind, you know, additional trade-offs, right? Um, any, anything to add to that or sure. uh, how to reconcile some of that? Thank you so much for that question. Um, yeah, I think it's this, um, this question of how do you, how do you balance different trade-offs and, and sort of weight different criteria is, is so important and it's such a challenge. And I would say two things I'd say one, um, is that first we need to make sure that we're considering all the relevant data and criteria. So I think um, thinking about the localized impacts is, is part of that where it's a it's a gap right now. So you can't you can't include it in your decision making if you don't evaluate it. So I think one is we need to really make sure we're considering all the relevant criteria and then to, to really look closely at um, the values and principles guiding our decision and ensuring that um, the right stakeholders are involved in, in informing those decisions so that um, you can make sure to incorporate the priorities and values of those are those who would be most impacted by the alternatives choices. Right, really insightful. Um, thank you so much, Vina. Um, this is it's a really really great case case study of really you know using uh, life cycle kind of impacts to from an environmental justice lens to really inform. Um, metrics and considerations. So um, we'll move on to our, ne our next um, presenter, um, who is um, uh, Zhao Wing Wang, um, who is a senior scientist um, at ETH Zurich. Um, and so let's move um, the slide forward and get you started. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you uh, so much. And thank you for the opportunity.
to present our studies like uh, a bit uh, into the essential use concepts and uh, trying to uh, also it's linked to the alternatives assessments. Uh, yeah, so uh, like I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Ian Cousins, Jamie DeWitt, Juliana, um, and, and the others. So it was really great teamwork in the past years to work in the field of the essential use concepts. And I will also like to acknowledge the Global PFAS Science Panel uh, and the Tides Foundation for supporting this cooperation. So the, uh, the presentation is based on two, uh, present, uh, two recently published papers, which I also listed here. Um, the background of the essential use comes back to the 1992, uh, when the, uh, the Montreal Protocol made a decision to codify the essential use. So it is for uh, to regulate, uh, to restrict the ozone depleting substances. And it was decided that for certain uses, uh, there, there needs to be exemptions. And it was defined as uh, when the use is, is, it is necessary for the health, safety, or is critical for the functioning of society, encompassing cultural and intellectual aspects. And the second part of the criteria, uh, definition is that uh, there are no available technically uh, and economically feasible alternatives or substitutes that are acceptable from the standpoint of environment and health. So in uh, 2019, my co-authors and I we, uh, wrote a paper about like to introducing this the essential use concept for regulating PFAS. Uh, and uh, since that paper was published, there were, we've got also a lot of supportive voice. Uh, for example, the European Chemical Strategy for Sustainability has also incorporated uh, the concepts in it. Uh, uh, at the same time, we have also heard uh, some strong criticism uh, and when analyzing such criticism, we, we found that uh, some of this uh, strong criticism were actually caused by a lack of understanding or misinterpretation of the concept. Therefore, that we would like to address these uh, common questions and also the misinterpretations. So uh, just maybe the essential use framework in a nutshell is that it divides the use of a chemical into three categories. First is the non-essential use. These are the uses of chemicals, uh, the chemicals that does not have a function necessary for health, safety, or the functioning of society. Uh, these are primarily driven by market opportunity. Uh, we also have found some examples of like a P use of PFAS, for example, in the bike chain lubricants and the ski waxes. So they're not really needed and can be fairly easily uh, removed from the products. Uh, the second is, uh, the second category is called the substitutable uses. These are use of the chemicals that does not, uh, does have a function necessary for health, safety, or the functioning of society, but there are suitable alternatives so they can be uh, safely replaced. Um, for example, like the PFAS use in, in, in many use of the uh, uh, firefighting forms and also PFAS use uh, in certain water resistant textiles. And then there's a third category is called essential uses. These are the essential uses that does have a really needed uh, desired function and that there are no suitable alternatives. For example, uh, there's PFAS in certain uh, medical devices or PFAS use in occupational protective clothing. Also like to highlight that uh, this essentiality should not be considered per, as per, permanent, rather a constant pressure is needed to search for alternatives in order to move these essential uses into uh, the category of substitutable uses. Here's a kind of a, one example about the PFAS use. Uh, 
uh, in textiles to illustrate the different categories of the essential use concepts. Uh, the, like there, there are many yeah, uses of PFAS to treat different, very different textiles from the leisure outwear to outdoor apparel uh, to, to like the medical and military. And then uh, all these textiles, they do have very different uh, performance requirements. Therefore, it's also uh, the essentiality of the use of PFAS there is very different. And for leisure out, outerwear, it does not uh, it can really meets the, the, the uh, yeah. So it can be categorized as non-essential ones, uh, whereas for the outdoor apparels, the, yeah, the water repellency is, does, is the function that is needed, but it can be safely achieved by uh, using other substitutions Therefore, uh, the, this category, uh, they can be categorized as substitutable use, whereas the medical apparel and also military apparel uh, has, uh, have much higher uh, technical performance requirements. Therefore, they are currently still uh, essential and the development of alternatives are needed. Uh, and also, I'd like to highlight that the category two, the substitutable uses, is, is really an entry point for substitution and to consider the, the chemical function, the end use function, or service function, as highlighted uh, by Tickner uh, in 2015. Uh, yeah, I would like to uh, clarify uh, some of these. Uh, there have been some some common misinterpretations. Like, to, yeah, I think we identify one important one is that, like, want to cl really clarify that is the essential concept is not uh, like the essential use that doesn't mean that the chemicals are essential. So it is really about the, the uses of a chemical of concern in processes and or products. So it, it really goes back to the original purpose of adding chemicals in processes and our products. It is really about having a, or a particularly function that is negative. So, the, so the concept is really about the use of a chemical. It's not about uh, the chemicals themselves. Um, the second is that this concept is not a threat to innovation, but rather an opportunity um, particularly because we really need innovation to uh, invent new uh, processes and products free from chemicals of concern. This is very much desired by the consumers as like recently there's have been a lot of calls um, by the consumers for greater product transparency and a few ingredients, for example, in personal care products. And this is also supported by many retail retailers. So this also ensures a growing market for safer products. For example, like in the Nordic countries, uh, the co-op, the supermarket chain uh, requests PFAS, uh, many different PFAS free products. So it really helped to uh, yeah, establish a kind of level playing field for the alternatives. Um, and who, yeah, we have also been thinking about who should apply the essential use concept. We think it's not only a concept for the regulators to, uh, to, to use in the regulatory context, but it also is, can be uh, voluntarily used by downstream industry users and the procurement officers to help to phase out hazardous chemicals in a voluntary manner. And speaking about that, uh, so also like to highlight that we think that this uh, the the concept is, should be applied to the chemicals of uh, concern like individually or as groups uh, and the the definition of the chemicals of concern can be quite uh, yeah uh, can have quite different range for example based on the intrinsic properties of concerns such as uh, persistence, bioaccumulation potential, toxicity, and or mobility, uh, and also like when it's negatively impacts on circularity or on the other technical performance, 
that it may be also considered as a uh, chemicals of concern. For example, like the carbon black is used as a colorant in plastics, but it really disturbs the uh, sorting, automatic sorting of plastics, therefore impact uh, the chemical or uh, the plastic recycling. And the, the, the use of carbon black is not real uh, in many plastics are not really essential. They just to increase the contracts store uh, to the foods. So the food would appear uh, more appealing. So, so such a use is not necessary, it's not essential. Therefore, uh, retailers have also called it to be removed. Uh, yeah, we have also have a bit more examples about the impacts on the circularity in the paper listed here. Um, and we also have sort of like there's also um, in many parts of the world, uh, technical performance standards have been used for products. And we have recognized that it is a very important, uh, these technical performance standards are very important. Uh, in defining whether the use of a chemical of concern is considered the substitutable or essential because it, the, this, the, this standards really set uh, whether alternatives provide the suitable for performance required. Um, and also differences in technical standards can lead to um, in the different regions and different sectors can lead to differences uh, in the essentiality det uh, determinations. Uh, we have also noticed that some te technical standards can create technological lockings that really inhibit phase out of chemicals of concern. For example, like the previous US flames uh, flammability standards for the polyurethane foam used in uh, furnitures. There's also this paper explained a bit more in detail, which you can uh, yeah, look at later. That's like uh, the, the cheapest way to achieve the, this technical performance standards is to use a lot of uh, brominated flame retardants. Therefore, it is not really uh, helpful when we would like to phase out the brominated flame retardants. Uh, therefore, that's it's also when phasing out chemicals, it's also good to reflect on the the technical performance standards, whether we really need such high performance or whether the performance uh, can be adjusted. Oh uh, yeah, and uh, also we have been thought about the regrettable substitutions, how can they be avoided? Uh, and, yeah, and uh, like we do think that like the chemical alternative assessment is really a key tool. Um, and I very much agree with the previous uh, the, uh, speaker that like a lack of information on chemical identities and hazard properties can really add uncertainties to the substitution process. Uh, yeah, here I originally had a, another example is about this uh, using organophosphate as the flame retardant to replace some of these brominated flame retardants. And then we learned that uh, yeah, the organophosphates as the flame retardants are just as problematic as the, the, their predecessors. Uh, again, we think that like for many of these uh, applications, uh, like it will be great to have perhaps uh, when doing the alternative assessment, it will be great to have a technical experts committees uh, with different expertise. Uh, to to like to help to create the greater transparency, for example, also to better understand uh, the technical performance requirements. Is that really needed to have such high performance requirement, or is that uh, a, okay to adjust and also to facilitate or the alternative assessment? Also, yeah, including uh, different aspects. Uh, also, as the previous speakers have said. So yeah, my presentation is coming to an end. I would like just to re-emphasize four take-home messages. So the essential use concept has been proposed to address wide chemicals of concern. Uh, it builds on the initial purpose of chemicals, i.e. like we're really adding chemicals uh, in, a, in, a given in given processes and products is really to have specific functions. 
uh, it divides the use of the chemicals of concern into three categories, uh, non-essential substitutable and the essential uses and chemical alternative assessments is needed for substitutable and essential uses. Um, finally, we would like to advocate like a great transparency on the intended use function by chemical of concern, uh, as well as on the chemical identity, hazard information and technical performance of possible alternatives is very much desired. Uh, so, and thank you very much for your attention. Terrific and very timely too. So we do have a couple question uh, time for a couple questions um, for Xiao Wing. Um, I uh, I'm seeing um, one question from Michaela Cle uh, Clever Cleaver um, from uh, Subsport um, who has a poster uh, tomorrow. Um, everybody join. Um, I am concerned that the essential use concept will slow down substitution efforts for uses claimed as essential. Any ideas to prevent this? Um, I think it, it's. Uh, I think it will not really slow down that. But I think we just need to have, for example, when applying for the essential use concepts and for those categories, uh, categorized as the essential use, then they should have a time. Uh, yeah, a sunset time. So that, for example, we say like five years. <laughs> you have five more years. Then it will be gone. Yeah, I think this will also give the pressure to really uh, speed up the substitution. Yeah. And so there's a there's a you know a point or a question from Huckleberry Palmer who says, you know, what is defined as essential for a functioning society says quite a lot about who actually makes the decision. Right. And so I think a lot of a lot of us are trying to think this through of like, well, who's going to claim something as essential? I know Joel Techner kind of adds to that, which says that's why we need to actually focus first on functional needs and this essentiality kind of um, question comes second. I don't know if you want to speak to this, who gets to decide, and is there a way of maybe kind of changing that hierarchy to, to deal with that at, at some level? Yeah, I think this is a really good question and it has been asked a lot. Uh, first of all, I would like to also to highlight that uh, in the EU, there's a currently a working stream really to uh, like def uh, decide on how we would implement it, uh, implement the essential use in the European Union. So I think this is also a process to be watched. I think it will also give food for thought for other parts of the uh, world. Uh, and the second, I think, uh, yeah, I think this is a really important question that we also uh, I, I totally I very much agree with the, the Joe that we really need to think about the really the functions and the, the performance needed. Uh, for PFAS, I, I know that a couple of years ago I went to a, a workshop and there was a presentation about the, uh, like doing survey on uh, consumers what they really expect from the uh, textile or from the clothing, and it was first about to keep them warm, the second about like looking beautiful. And the water repellency is at the very, very late for, for consumer's choice. So I think this is also speaking for, uh, partially speaking for the essential reality of such uses. So perhaps we need to do more. Uh, so also by engage like the uh, social scientists to engage more in terms of what really consumers want. Great. Thank you. There's some interesting comments and, and helpful comments here also from um, Sherry Franjevic and, and Liz Harriman. I encourage all of you um, to go back um, to your chat log and, and look it through, but um, I, wanna, I wanna move on. So um, Zhao Wing, really important. Again, this is a fast moving concept um, given what's happening with the chemical strategy for sustainability. So um, thank you for bringing it um, uh, to bear with this alternatives assessment community. Again, I think there's a, a lot coming down the pike, especially of how this might plays out in terms of how we're thinking about evaluating alternatives and, and, move, and, and thinking through this essentiality concept. So um, thank you. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. All right. So let's bring up our last speaker, um, Emilio Nestor, uh, Nestler, who is a senior environmental scientist with uh, Northwest Green Chemistry. Um, Amelia, um, 
Great. Time okay. to take it over. And she's going to close us out thinking about kind of directions for kind of A4 practice and and um, and also A4, uh, uh, excuse me, A alternatives at, um, assessment um, practice and policy and the role of A4. So please. We're just trying to get as many P words in there as possible so we can all trip Thank over. you, yes. <laughs> uh, so we go to the, the next slide. Um, alternatives assessment as a methodology was designed to assist users in identifying preferred alternatives to the currently used hazardous chemicals. And one thing I just sort of wanted to start with is thinking about what the possible goals of alternative assessment is, you know, could be. Um, that we want to look for. And the ones that I've heard the most over this conference are that alternatives assessment would eliminate the use of chemicals of concern and encourage the use of actual safer alternatives. And that's sort of at, at the core of what an alternatives assessment is supposed to do. But the hope would be um, that we'd also work to achieving some of these other side goals, like identifying some safer alternatives and encouraging research and development into these safer alternatives as well as identifying any barriers that are preventing adoption um, and preventing the development of those safer alternatives. And so with that in mind, I wanted to sort of think about how the policy interacts with that and how our current efforts in using alternatives assessment in policy um, are, are working to achieve these goals. And I think one, one area where it's really become a bit of a problem is that alternatives assessment is often being applied now in a flipped manner, where instead of using alternatives assessment to eliminate a chemical of concern and identify the safer alternatives, it's being used to justify the continued use of hazardous chemical ingredients. So when we include alternatives assessment in legislation, in policy, um, it gets different definitions put on it, it gets different limitations put on it, um, and the lawmakers struggle to incorporate it in a way that will actually get us to these goals. And some of that, I think, is where A4 can have a role in really promoting quality alternatives assessments and policy. Next slide. And there's four key areas that we identified that really need to, to be addressed within A4 and policy. We know that alternatives assessment methodology requires flexibility, but the resulting discretion decision making impacts the results, sometimes resulting in erroneous conclusions. We also need a careful consideration of where the burden of proof lies. It can be put in in a way that encourages filling in data gaps and sharing data, but often the way that we're applying it, it encourages organizations to keep that as a trade secret. Public transparency and engagement enables interested parties to provide feedback, improving the selection and assessment process. And A4 really has an amazing opportunity here to define the standards and certifications of what makes a quality alternatives assessment practitioner. And in doing so, A4 can assist organizations in need of alternatives assessment to identify practitioners and researchers who can assemble quality and comprehensive data and analysis. Next slide. I've included here a sequential outline to an alternatives assessment from the IC2AA guide. From the very beginning, the importance of user choice is apparent. What are the alternatives that are even being considered here? Being choosy about what alternatives are even considered is an easy way to game the system and basically generate an alternatives assessment that says there are no, no preferred alternatives available even though there are in reality. And so limiting user discretion is important when incorporating alternatives assessment into policy. Beyond just selecting alternatives, we can think about what level each module is assessed at, what criteria are used and what additional modules are being considered. Next slide. As an example, I wanted to talk about our work with antifouling boat paint that we did for Washington State in 2017. Antifouling boat paint is the paint used on the bottom of boats to keep algae and barnacles from growing. And copper is one of the most commonly used biocides in recreational antifouling boat paint. Unfortunately, it's toxic to salmon, particularly in freshwater. Um, but it is a necessary component of these paints. If you remove the copper from the paint, fouling will occur, which can damage the vessel and results in increased drag. Uh, 
So the alternatives assessment was really in my mind about solving for X, what product or process or something could manage that fouling yet still be safe for salmon. Next slide. And the example I wanted to give here was really thinking about the discretion that we had in what we considered in this alternatives assessment. So a biocide supplier would probably think about, well, what are the other biocides that are an option? Um, a paint supplier might look at other biocidal paints as well as non-biocidal paints. From our perspective, we were motivated to look at any possible solution, even non-coding solutions like ultrasound devices or marina-wide solutions like a boat wash that completely removes the need for a coating at all. Um, but depending on where you sit in the supply chain, the alternatives that you look at are going to be different, right? Um, what sort of seems like an obvious option to you are going to be different. And when it comes to public policy, what is going to be reasonable to require of these different organizations who are doing alternatives assessments, particularly when the conclusion of the alternatives assessment is there are no alternatives, we have to consider continue using these hazardous chemicals. Next slide. Public transparency is a critical check on this. It can improve results, increase adoption, and decrease duplication. Uh, with that example I just gave there, public transparency gives an opportunity for other organizations to come out of the woodwork and talk about, hey, you missed this key entire class of alternatives that are non-coding based. Um, and so that, that is a, a critical area where we need other people to step in. Um, it can also decrease duplication because we are then able to build upon others alternatives assessment works and what's been done in the past, what's been looked at in the past, and it can increase adoption. The, th this is more about stakeholder engagement here and when a government agency is doing the alternatives assessment than the manufacturer themselves. But when you engage with the stakeholders, even if it doesn't change the results of the alternatives assessment, just listening to their concerns and having that explicitly acknowledged in the final report, acknowledged in your presentations, can go a long way towards increasing adoption of safer alternatives, even if they're not being mandated. Next slide. Another example of where public transparency could step in, I wanted to bring in this example for some work we did on some phthalates, um, also for Washington State. Uh, one of the main functions of the phthalates we were looking at is as a plasticizer. So it's used to make rigid plastic like PVC more flexible. So something like the, the little rubber ducky there. When it comes to that use, there are quite a few alternatives available. Um, some of them like DHT or DINCH have pretty complete hazard profiles. Um, it definitely look to be less hazardous than the phthalates that we're talking about here. But when we went and talked to manufacturers of some products um, that are currently using these phthalates as plasticized, and we asked them, well, what about using DHT? What about using DINCH? They told us that it doesn't work. Absolutely doesn't work. You just get a mess out at the other end. Well, it turns out that if you treat this as a drop-in replacement, of course, it's not going to work. There's no such thing as a drop-in replacement. When you substitute um, a phthalate like DHP for an alternative like DHT or DINCH, um, you usually have to change some other, uh, other components to the process as well. You might need to add another ingredient like a fat fuser. You might need to change your processing time or your processing temperatures. So there's a lot of other uh, tweaks to the process that might need to be addressed in order to get a good product out at the other end of the manufacturing process. Next slide. I liken this to baking a cake. You can have an amazing recipe, um, works perfect every time, but if you try to substitute your all-purpose flour for gluten-free flour, you probably will get a mess out the other end. That said, given a few tries, maybe you need to add some other ingredients, change your time or temperature for baking, you can get that recipe to work with gluten-free flour. Plenty of bakers have said that XYZ product could never be made gluten-free, um, and then other, you know, inspired bakers have stepped out and proven them wrong. So how do we know that something like an alternative to phthalates do work well as plasticizers for PVC? Because others have done it and they've succeeded. They've shown that you just need some of these other tweaks. Public transparency is a check in understanding whether or not the performance tests that have been done by the manufacturer, by the group doing the alternatives assessment, are really sufficient and a good description of what performance might actually be like. Um, 
Next slide. So we should work to set up policy to require or encourage data sharing, such as the full list of ingredients of a product that's being considered as an alternative. We should also be working to set up policy to encourage the filling in of data gaps, such as doing actual performance testing or doing toxicology research. research. Now, of course, that said, policymakers want to avoid banning a chemical of concern until a safer alternative is identified. I just want to take a moment to think about the difference between we don't have sufficient data, so we can't say there are safer alternatives versus we don't have sufficient data, so we can't say there aren't safer alternatives. And where that puts the burden of proof in showing that something is hazardous or that something is less hazardous um, lies, where that puts the burden of proof of knowing what the data is. We've heard a few times uh, throughout this conference that we need more motivations for companies to actually engage in this work. Um, when we look at the boat paint work that we did, we were able to get a couple companies um, under an NDA to share full ingredients with us, complete disclosure of every ingredient in their product. Um, and I know that that has been a big challenge for people, um, including us, in other alternatives assessments we were done. One key thing that's different about that boat paint example, copper was already being banned. It already had a sunset date. There was a date that it was getting phased out. And I think that having those sunset dates really motivates companies to engage with the process, to either show, you know, engage fully and share the data so that we know that there are no alternatives yet. And so that we then, now we are motivated to change the sunset date or to show, okay, yeah, maybe there actually are, are alternatives and really just engage in what's going on. Um, next slide. Hmm. And that brings me to what sort of some ideas on a role for, for where A4 can sit in this. Um, right now, how do we know that an alternatives assessment practitioner is qualified? How do we know who is going to be a qualified person to review that alternatives assessment as a peer review process or professional review process? What standard language could, could be incorporated into legislation or rulemaking? Um, that would ensure that when AAs are being included in policy, that they're actually um, working towards those goals I talked about at the beginning of this talk. How do we ensure that environmental justice is included? And I really wanted to thank uh, the previous speakers for talking about environmental justice here and how it is lacking from our current frameworks. It's mentioned, it's optional. Um, and avoiding burden shifting is one of the important goals that we could really have for alternatives assessment. Um, how do we ensure that innovation is uh, still being considered? Next slide. Um, so I wanted to talk with this, uh, an example from the Toxic Free Kids program. So this is a program being run in Oregon by the Oregon Health Authority. And it requires manufacturers of children's products to notify the state if high priority chemicals of concern for children's health or HPCCC ages are present. I'm just gonna call those chemicals of concern. Uh, and then it requires removal or substitution if those chemicals of concern are present in certain products. Um, if they substitute, they're required to provide a hazardous ass assessment showing that it is a less hazardous alternative. Or they can apply with a, a, with a waiver application, either using an exposure assessment or an alternatives assessment to justify the continued use of the high priority chemicals of concern for children's health. Um, now, for those who aren't familiar, this is a state level policy in the US. Um, it's passed by the elected officials in Oregon. And then the responsible agency, the Oregon Health Authority, goes into a rulemaking process. So we have the text from the legislation itself that constrains us. And then the Oregon Health Authority writes the rules that determine how that policy is actually being implemented. They have to follow the legislation, but there's a fair amount of flexibility that goes into those exact details. So the legislation itself constrains the agency and how they can apply alternatives assessment. Um, and there were some problems apparent immediately. Um, there's no time limit on how long a waiver lasts. We all know that an alternatives assessment is really a snapshot in time. And we might find no alternatives today, but five years from now, that story could be completely different, but there was no time limit. Um, and there's no way to add a time limit without new legislation here. Um, and in a similar vein, the legislation gives a certain amount of flexibility to the agency. Um, 
but we've all seen, and, and there's a positive side to that, right? In that, that lets them determine the best path forward, working with stakeholders like the manufacturers, um, like, um, like interested nonprofits. Um, but there's also a negative side to flexibility. Um, if the if the organization, the administration that's in charge of implementing uh, that policy uh, has a change and they're no longer interested in promoting alternatives assessment or or you know continuing on this path, it's pretty easy to write the rules in a way that would then scuttle alternatives assessment and make it not be a useful part of the program. Um, so we really need some clear language to incorporate into policy so that we're doing the same alternatives assessments in different states and so that we're able to implement best practices. And what we've learned you know, from doing alternatives assessments in different states and different countries to the new alternatives assessment legislation that's coming down. And there's definitely a role for A4 to play here and in our members to play, not only in coming up with what would those best policies be, but then in going and talking to the agencies and participating in the rulemaking process to ensure that that's what actually gets down in the rules. And even then before that, that that's actually what gets passed in the legislation. And there was a pretty stark contrast between say hazard assessment and alternatives assessment during the rulemaking process. We have pretty clear standards for hazard assessment and certification programs that can be pointed to. There are multiple ones that are good and high quality um, that can be relied on. For alternatives assessment, we don't have that same, um, that same level available. Uh, we have some very robust guides out there, but none of them are really addressing the specific situation that this program is in, a regulatory requirement to complete an AA to justify the continued use of a hazardous chemical. So it's a very different scenario. Um, Amelia, I'll need you to wrap up. Next slide. And it's my last one. <laughs> so um, how can A4 address these key areas? Um, there's a lot of different potential roles and steps. And I think um, in some ways this is a, a challenge to A4 and also to all of our members to engage in this process and really think about what, what are the best practices in policy and how can we ensure that the alternatives assessments being enacted in regulations are actually moving us onto uh, next slide, the goals that I talked about at the beginning. Uh, and with that, I'd just like to thank everyone. Um, all the speakers we've had have just been excellent. It's been really great to hear everyone's perspectives and learn. Um, and I'd love to take any questions. <laughs> thank you, Amelia. Yeah, we have time for maybe one or two um, questions for Amelia. Amelia, this is a nice, um, again, launching off point from, from the panels yesterday on policy. I mean, there was uh, lots of thinking um, about the challenges of uh, alternatives assessment and policy. And, the, um, you know, Paul mentioned, for example, uh, the role potentially of something like A4 to de develop the more robust um, methods and guidance that can, um, you know, be directly insert in, inserted in policy. Um, I think, Amelia, you're thinking about something of the same to create that standardization um, uh, that we're needing. But any any thoughts for um, Amelia? Questions for Amelia? And I will say there are a lot of other organizations at the table, right? When you're in those, those rulemaking sessions, there are definitely organizations representing the manufacturers of chemicals. You know, ACC is there, the Toy Manufacturing Association is there. Um, you know, because we're talking about kids products, so of course, the Toy Manufacturing Association is there. Um, so there's there's a lot of groups like that who are there at the table. But, you know, for that rulemaking session, other than people who were representatives of different government agencies who happened to know about alternatives assessment, I was the only one who'd done one mm -hmm. or who had done hazard assessment who was in the room at the time. Um, right. Um, okay, there's one comment and then we'll, or question, we'll pose it. I don't know, Pat, if this question is directed at Amelia. I have a feeling there's a number of people on this, in this community that can address Pat's question, but how do we connect, um, you know, those looking for alternatives with those that can offer them? Um, I think there's That's a part. Yeah, I, I, th I have a feeling, Pat, that might be best answered by a number of people who are kind of creating those dialogues and creating those intersections. Um, and uh, I think the panel you were in earlier answered some of those questions as well, right? That's definitely something that Chem Forward is working on. How do we make those connections? Um, the ChemSec Marketplace is trying to do that. Uh, 
you know, US EPA's Safer Chemicals Ingredients list, all these different certification programs and opportunities to show that your product is less hazardous, your chemical ingredient is less hazardous, um, are out there, but we are still struggling with how do we get that down to all the manufacturers? Yeah, um, yeah. So I think there is a big question there. I also saw another question I wanted to address. Um, this is from Vina, who asked about um, thoughts on first steps to better integrating environmental justice into alternatives assessment. And I think that there's kind of two ways to think about it. One would be to require an environmental justice module, but I'm not sure that having a standalone environmental justice module is really the right answer. I think that we need to look at the guide, the entire guide through an environmental justice lens and think about in the hazard module, where is environmental justice and how should it be incorporated? In the performance module, where, do, where is it? How should it be incorporated? And that, that's a, you know, a methodical process that can be done you know, sort of at the guide level to incorporate it throughout and ensure that you know from the very beginning, I think we need to set some basic goals and criteria around where does environmental justice sit within this work. Right, great. Well, thank you, Amelia. We're at the close of our session, and um, very timely. My um, my co-chair, um, not my co-chair, but our A4 co-chair for. Um, our program committee, um, who was supposed to um, facilitate this uh, session but had a, a conflict, um, wanted to close us out. So if we can just um, turn it to Meg and Meg, thank you for all of your work that you've done to put on this program and, um, and why don't you close out our session? Great, thank you. I had a conflict and I couldn't substitute myself, no pun intended. So um, I only got to catch the tail end of this. Um, the fun is not over yet. Um, we've got a lot of exciting activities tomorrow. So please tune in tomorrow. Um, we'll have the actually the A4 poster session. So um, please interact. It's from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Eastern time. Um, there are some uh, great posters from people who are at the student level all the way to super experts like Hans. Um, so, and then my coworker, Jen T and Adelina will be presenting too. So please take the time um, to show your support and your interest and uh, let these experts and future experts feature what they've been working on in terms of safer and sustainable substitutes. So thanks for joining us. Um, and uh, then we'll also have uh, for 30 minutes symposium closing remarks um, from Pam Spencer, our A4 president, as well as Joel Tickner, the executive director of A4 and esteemed professor of public health at UMass Lowell. Um, it's, uh, we have uh, Pam and Joel to thank for most of what we've been doing and getting us all in step together. So um, thanks for joining us today. Thank you again to our sponsors. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. Um, and um, I won't name them all. We were very excited though to have um, two different specialty sections of uh, SOT join us uh, this year too, quite exciting. So um, thanks very much everyone for attending today. Um, please make sure to uh, uh, log in tomorrow. We're not done yet with uh, learning and sharing with each other. Uh, have a great day. Thanks again, bye-bye.